It's InfoWars Nightly News. We are back. We're going to go to this short video clip with the uh, director and filmmaker uh, Bill Bean um, dealing with Timothy McVeigh a few years before the Oklahoma City bombing at a demolition military base a year after he was supposedly out of the military. Here's that clip, then we're going to Mr. Bean. Hi, my name is Bill Bean. I work in the film industry. On August 3rd, 1993, I was at Camp Grafton, North Dakota. Camp Grafton is a military training academy for the United States Army, the Army Reserve, and the National Guard. The reason I was there was to scout locations for a film project I was working on. I was given a tour of the base designated by Colonel Dahl. We were by the uh, motor pool and there were a large group of tanks that were parked there. I saw two soldiers parking a, an armored vehicle. I asked the billeting director if I could go over and interview the soldiers. So I walked over to the armored vehicle. It had a porthole in the back. I entered inside. The soldier who had been driving the vehicle was closing a hatch in the front. When he turned around, he looked at me and he froze. I had my video camera running and I said to him, what's your job? And he looked at me and he said, what? I said, what's your job? He says, I'm nobody, I'm just a parts clerk. On August 3rd, 1993, is when I videotaped and interviewed Timothy McVeigh a year and a half after he was supposedly out of the military completely. I never knew that the soldier in the tank meant a damn thing until 1997 or 1998. I brought my videotape over to a friend of mine who knew my project and he told me he'd like to see what, I, what I'd shot, what I recently shot. He said to me, uh, let me see it. So I popped the tape in and it started in the middle where the McVeigh footage was, only I didn't know it was McVeigh at the time. And my friend said to me, where did you shoot this? And I said, well, that was a Camp Grafton in North Dakota. He said, do you know who that is? And I said, I don't know, so just some guy in a tank didn't want to talk to me. He says, no, that's Timothy McVeigh. That's the guy who blew up the Murrow Federal Building. And I said to him, are you sure? And he says, yeah. He says, I've been watching the trial all day on TV. Again, that was a clip from the film, A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City, 1995. Uh, with one of the most intriguing characters in this entire saga seeking uh, after the truth. I've interviewed him in many years. Um, Bill Bean is a filmmaker currently living in Chicago, and um, he has made a lot of different you know, films and also acted as well. And we'll get him to basically break down the story of his run-in with uh, this supposed mastermind of the Oklahoma City bombing, Timothy McVeigh, uh, which subsequently did get picked up by some major newspapers and magazines in the United States, but never became a big nightly news issue. And it's undoubtedly McVeigh uh, there at a um, demolitions base, a, a army base specializing in demolitions. And uh, the footage is undoubtedly him. And, and this fits into what we know about McVeigh, that he had been sheep dipped or basically uh, taken out of the military and put into clandestine operations, a well-known practice. And joining us to break it down is Bill Bean. Bill, thanks for coming on with us. Sure. Good to be here, Alex. You're the expert on this. Uh, start at the beginning. Okay. I was producing a film. I had written a screenplay and I had gotten to the stage where I had investors that were interested, but they wanted to see something ahead of time. So they knew that they were investing their money correctly. So I went out to the Dakotas to get a lock on locations. I went out to ranches. I went out to farms. I talked to people. One of the people I talked to was Jeff Esslinger at the North Dakota film office. Jeff read my screenplay, Jeff uh, talked to me about what I wanted to shoot, and he was sending me to a couple of different locations, and he added uh, that I could go to a military base because I had a, several military bases in my screenplay. I had actually told him that I really wasn't that interested. I had a lock on a couple of other bases, but he said, why don't you just show up? If you don't want to use it, that's fine. It's right on your way. So I contacted the uh, Camp Grafton in North Dakota. It's a military training academy. 
What they teach there is explosives and demolition and bridge building. And I had a meeting prepared <clears throat> with a Colonel Dahl. Colonel Dahl was the superintendent of Camp Grafton. I videotaped Colonel Dahl talking to me and stating that I was at Camp Grafton to scout locations for my film. And then Colonel Dahl turned me over to the billeting director, uh, by a man by the name of Paul Osser. Uh, Paul actually took me on the tour of the base. The tour lasted, oh, about two hours or so. Uh, we, we looked at any location I wanted to look at. We went to some general locations. Uh, we went to the uh, rec room, the mess hall. I videotaped all the locations. Then we got to some of the more interesting places. Uh, we went to the motor pool where they had gigantic earth moving equipment. Uh, we went to the armory, which I actually got a kick out of. Uh, I didn't really know what it was. It was just a big vaulted door. And I said to the, uh, to the uh, soldiers in charge there, I said, gee, could I go in there? And they said, oh, okay. So they opened up the armory. They had to unlock a door like you do at a vaulted safe in a bank. I went inside, I videotaped that. Uh, we went over to the communications room. Uh, then we went outside of the motor pool and there was a long string of tanks, um, probably the length of a football field, uh, various kinds, various makes. Uh, in fact, I was informed that uh, several of the tanks uh, had been captured in the Gulf War. This was the first Gulf War. And uh, some of them were Russian, I believe. So uh, while I was videotaping that location, I saw a flatbed, a very large flatbed with two soldiers, one soldier inside and one soldier outside directing. So the, the armored vehicle, I've been corrected, I used to call it a tank and people have corrected me and say, well, no, that's not a tank, it's an armored vehicle. Okay, uh, I accept the correction, it's an armored vehicle and the one soldier was inside and he took the, took the armored vehicle off the flatbed and it stalled out once it got on the ground. I kept videotaping and it stalled out again. So rather than quit taping, I did a very slow 360 degree pan in all directions, establishing right then and there that I was at Camp Grafton and that this this armored vehicle was parked there at Camp Grafton. The billeting director that I was with was on the phone. And uh, since I had been able to go anywhere else I wanted to go, I said, gee, could I go uh, interview those guys? And he nodded yes. So I walked over and when the, um, when the armored vehicle was parked, I uh, entered it through a large porthole in the rear. I crouched in the entrance, and because the, uh, the vehicle had been running, uh, the individual parking the vehicle uh, wasn't aware that I was inside the, uh, the vehicle. Now you went in the rear hatch, and, and to be clear, this is, this is a few years before the Oklahoma City bombing, but about a year after, uh, I'm going for memory, so correct me if I'm wrong, but about a year after he'd supposedly been out of the military, and it matches photos from around the time with him being a bit thinner. Uh, but if you look at the hands, the rest of the body, I um, mean, I've studied this video closely over the years. It, 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 I'd say 99.9% .9 this is Tim McVeigh. What's your view on that? <clears throat> oh, oh yeah, there's no question that it's Tim McVeigh. Uh, I, I took the shot, uh, I froze, when I looked at the video years later, I froze it right when he turned around and I was able to, through computers, to put up specific shots of Tim McVeigh from that time. In fact, his military uh, shot where he is in the military uniform with the military cap, I placed right exactly next to it, plus a shot taken uh, when he was younger and he had longer hair. And when you put the three in a line, it is uh, Timothy McVeigh, no question. Um, the, the one problem we had was you couldn't see a name patch on there. 
but you could read on the on the left shoulder was a patch that took us quite a while to figure out what it was but it was the North Dakota National Guard patch which is like five arrows pointing up so he was wearing a North Dakota uh, National Guard patch and uh, so I got the shot uh, my tape is rolling I'm looking directly at him and he sort of freezes there for a second and I casually say to him, uh, what's your job? And he just sort of looks at me and he goes, what? And I said, what's your job? And he sorts, he tries to push his way past me, but because I'm crouched in the entrance, he can't get by. So he crouches in the corner out of camera range and he says, I'm just a parts clerk. And uh, I didn't really know what to make of that. I thought it was kind of insulting because He's not just a parts clerk, he's parking a tank and he must be a soldier there doing something, but I decided not to push him on it. So I, I said to him, oh, you're just parking this one, huh? And he says, yeah, basically. And then I let him pass by through the porthole. Now, uh, there's one interesting thing about this, which a lot of people miss. A lot of people say, well, how do I know that that was, maybe it's Tim McVeigh, which everybody agrees once they have seen the, uh, seen the tape and once they've read the forensics report, which uh, Professor Blomgren at the University of Utah, the uh, voice uh, speech and pathology department did a forensics test comparing the person in the tank with a known uh, uh, 60 Minutes interview with McVeigh and Professor Blomgren contacted me saying he's run all the tests. He will testify in a court of law as an expert that this is Timothy McVeigh and he's sure of it. Now inside the tank there was a plast uh, an unbreakable glass plastic turret right at the top and for a fraction of a second after McVeigh passes me I put the camera up into the turret and I shoot through. I, I couldn't get my head up there to shoot it. I just shot it through with the camera looking through the glass. And there you see the same thing I did the 360 degree angle of just like two minutes before. The exact same uh, trucks are parked there, the cloud structure in the, si the sky, it's all the same. Well, so Bill, if we go back when I first interviewed you, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, uh, you know, so much more has come out confirming the true story, the true horror of what took place there at Oklahoma City. Uh, and, and, and of course, at Infowars.com, we carry the film A Noble Lie. That's really the only modern, well-done film. Uh, just amazing uh, information, the interviews in it, and, and you're an important piece of that. Uh, but uh, pulling back from this, separate from, from the context of all the other pieces of the puzzle, what is so important in your own words, because I know it's important, but I want your perspective about your piece of information. Why is this so important that Timothy McVeigh was in the military a year after they claim he was out? Well, Timothy McVeigh served in the first Gulf War, and then he supposedly totally left the military by May of 1992. All the military records say that he was out. He was never again in the military wasn't in the Army, he wasn't in the Army Reserve, he was not in the National Guard. His activities at this time were when he was meeting with, they say, right-wing types or militia types or anti-government types, and they totally lose track. The FBI uh, and everyone concerned says somehow he totally leaves visibility for like a two-month period. And it is during this time on August 3rd, 1993, that I videotaped Timothy McVeigh at Camp Grafton, uh, establishing that he was in uniform, parking a tank, and he was in a tank corps when he was in the military. He knew about tanks. And if you go to that base, I was told, you go to that bank base to learn to blow things up and to be a bridge builder. And I videotaped the class, where you you learn about explosives and demolition and i i actually as just as a fluke videotaped the books on the tables of the explosives and demolition uh books that were there so this establishes absolutely that there is a lie by the united states government by the military by the fbi the fbi could not be so stupid not to know this that mcveigh was in the military probably under an assumed name 
uh, when I did the story and Hustler picked up on it, Hustler had their uh, investigators go to Camp Grafton and request information as to whether or not Timothy McVeigh was at Camp Grafton. And the statement from the military was that there are no records that state Timothy McVeigh was at Camp Grafton either on the day I was there and videotaped him or at any other time. So he was never ever supposed to be at Camp Grafton and yet I videotaped him and it proves that he was there most probably under an assumed name. So there's a cover then for, for Timothy McVeigh and this ties in with his statements and his family statements that he was working for the government surreptitiously, secretly, pretending to be anti-government, anti-American. And that's what all the experts from every angle have basically found and confirmed. That's what the entire uh, you know, images that we get with the Elohim City and the Southern Poverty Law Center and all of it. And he was going around the country. That's what in sworn affidavits Larry Nichols, as you know, has said. He was going around the country, infiltrating, getting data. And then a few days before, he got angry about the target uh, and about the daycare center and things like that. Uh, and so they went ahead and, I guess, set him up, kind of like Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, uh, to, to be clear, The uh, Noble Lie is an excellent film. They've got another extended edition coming out soon that's uh, reportedly going to have your footage in it. And they sent us just a short clip, but I was able to go to YouTube and pull up from, you know, a decade ago when we first put it out on local TV. And then since it's been on YouTube, a grainier copy of, uh, you know, the full thing of, of showing what you described of uh, you there talking to him uh, in the armored vehicle. Uh, but uh, there's no doubt this is McVeigh. Uh, and uh, where do you go from here? Because, I mean, your piece of the puzzle is so important. Where do you go from here? Are there any websites people can visit to learn more about your particular work? Uh, and any other points that you think are important to relay? Well, you can go to uh, A Noble Lie, and uh, you can see it on YouTube, or you can go to the website, and uh, you can... You can purchase the DVD. You can see the footage of me being interviewed, plus the footage of McVeigh on YouTube. Um, Timothy McVeigh is definitely there. It proves he's there. You ask me where I go. You know, I was harassed for many years without really understanding why. It wasn't until McVeigh's trial that I actually understood that this was McVeigh in the tank. Uh, events took place in my life. <clears throat> I was. I was harassed. I had hang-up phone calls. The, uh, the people that were investing in my film pulled out. People would say to me, did you make somebody mad? What's going on? And I would have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, it wasn't until not only that I saw that I had McVeigh on the tape, but until a couple of years later when I realized that this was the clincher piece, that this was the piece that established that McVeigh worked for the government, he wasn't some lone wolf nut hating the government, and that his actions were controlled, as he himself told uh, Terry Nichols and various other people. He didn't choose the targets, the targets were chosen for him. Uh, he was set up with people, people were, were instructed to deal with him. He was instructed to, to go along and cooperate and play the game as as part of an anti-American uh, right-wing nut or militia person or just a, a, a crazy person, but that was never the case. He was uh, acting under orders, and he admitted this to, to several people. Uh, I'm, well, that's I'm, right, and we also have just the entire, you know, the entire program we know was a false flag event, as the film Noble Lie and other research proves, but... Uh, in closing, when did you first discover that you had footage of McVeigh? Because you'd shot this years before out scouting. Uh, I mean, you may have answered it earlier, but just I mean, when did you first realize, wait a minute, I've got <clears throat> footage of this guy? Well, uh, I shot it on August 3rd, 1993, and I didn't realize that it was McVeigh in the tank until like 1997 when I had a... Uh, two hours of footage that I'd shot of various locations and people, and I was showing it to a friend of mine, and it just happened that this part in the tank of Camp Grafton came up, and my friend says, wait a minute, what is this? He says, well, where did you shoot this? I said, oh, that was at Camp Grafton in 93, and he says, don't you know who that is? And I said, 
I, well, I don't know. He didn't identify himself. And my friend told me, that's Timothy McVeigh. That's the guy who blew up the Murrow Federal Building. Uh, since then, I've talked to people. I've talked to VZ Lawton, who is a survivor of the Oklahoma City bombing, who attended the trial. And he establishes this is the man I saw. This is Timothy McVeigh. I've talked to Congressman Charles Key, Congressman from the state of Oklahoma, who also establishes this is this is Timothy McVeigh. Uh, so this is the clincher piece, at least my part of the clincher piece. No, it's a key. It's it's one of the most important pieces, and it just brings it all together, and it confirms all the other amazing evidence. Uh, Bill Bean, thank you so much for spending time with us, and I just want to again thank the filmmakers as well for helping get all the great researchers and people that have contributed uh, and, 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 and putting it all together in one film, A Noble Lie. And uh, I also want to thank you for your courage under that harassment. A lot of other people would have would have backed off, but uh, we- well, well, you know, Alex, uh, over 100 people were murdered that day. Little children were murdered. I have had people say to me over the years, you know, why don't you just, I actually had somebody say to me, why don't you just send the tape to Camp Grafton and then maybe they'll leave you alone. No, that's not what we do in life. We stand up for what's right. If we don't, life will only get worse. You're right, things have gotten pretty bad because a lot of folks just think if you give in to evil, uh, that it's going to back off, but that's not how it works. Bill Bean, look forward to speaking to you again, hopefully on the radio. And again, we salute you, my friend. Thank you, and I salute you too. Wow. That is an amazing individual.